In this video, we're going to take a look at the developments that took place in the Season 8 premiere of The Curse of Oak Island. But before we do, I'd like to let you know that my new book, The Oak Island Encyclopedia Volume 2, is now available on Amazon. This book contains plot summaries and analyses for each episode of Season 7 of The Curse of Oak Island, and includes chapters on three new theories regarding the nature of Oak Island's subterranean contents and the identities of its depositors. My book is available in both full color and much less expensive black and white, and would make a great gift for any hardcore fan of The Curse of Oak Island. If you'd like to get a copy of this book, please check out the link in the description. The narrator begins the two-hour-long Season 8 premiere of The Curse of Oak Island by describing how the 2020 Oak Island treasure hunt was hampered from the outset by the U.S.-Canada border shutdown resulted of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is against this grim backdrop, he says, that operations on Oak Island have ground to a halt, at least until the island's principal owners, brothers Rick and Marty Lagina, along with their co-workers and partners, can figure out how, if at all, they can proceed. In the next scene, Marty Lagina, Craig Tester, Alex Lagina, and Jack Begley sit down around a boardroom in Marty's office in Traverse City, Michigan, for a morning meeting on June 17, 2020. The treasure hunters discuss the implications of the border shutdown on their treasure hunt, and lament that, on its account, they will be unable to physically return to Oak Island for some time. The American treasure hunters proceed to Skype with their fellow Canadian treasure hunters, and with British metal detecting expert Gary Drayton and discuss their plans for the upcoming season. At the commencement of this virtual meeting, the Fellowship agrees that its Canadian members must take charge of operations on Oak Island until its American members are able to return to Nova Scotia. Dr. Ian Spooner reveals that he would like to investigate a potential anomaly in the southeastern corner of the Oak Island Swamp, which he discovered when comparing old aerial photographs of the wetland to the seismic data recovered in Season 7. Later in the episode, we learn that this anomaly is believed to lie 10 feet below the swamp's surface. Gary Drayton discloses that he has been shopping around for metal detectors, and has come across a piece of deep scanning equipment he would like to purchase and employ on the island. This scanner, which is later revealed to be the OKM EXP 6000 metal detector, not only picks up metal artifacts, but can also detect the presence of underground cavities, up to a depth of 60 feet. Charles Barkhouse then expresses a desire to have a diver re-explore the cavity at the bottom of Borehole C1, the shaft which he personally prescribed way back in Season 3, for reasons to which we were not made privy. Recall that in Season 3, Episode 13, the Fellowship of the Dig lowered an underwater camera down into the void at the bottom of this shaft. During this operation, the camera glimpsed a mysterious, shiny, gold-colored object embedded in the rock wall which several divers attempted to retrieve in subsequent episodes to no avail. Next, Doug Crowell explains that he spent the spring of 2020 poring over the old files tucked away in the home archive of the late Dan Blankenship. One of the more interesting items he unearthed was a survey map drawn by Fred Nolan when he and Blankenship were working together. Another item of interest was the Behringer Survey, a geophysical study of Oak Island's subterranean makeup conducted in 1988. Both of these documents indicated the presence of an underground tunnel on Oak Island's Lot 15, while the Behringer survey indicated the presence of another tunnel leading from the Money Pit to Lot 15. Intriguingly, two parallel rock walls sit on the line of the supposed tunnel suggested by both surveys, apparently leading into the hill on the slopes of which they lie. Later in the episode, surveyor Steve Guptill discovers that these stone walls are located exactly 500 feet from both the paved area and the Money Pit area. Following the meeting, Doug Crowell and Charles Barkhouse, two Canadian treasure hunters with access to Oak Island, meet with professional diver Mike Huntley at Borehole C1. We learn that the treasure hunters have decided to send a diver to re-explore the bottom of this shaft, due to the fact that the underground tunnel indicated by the aforementioned Behringer survey, dubbed the Behringer Tunnel, appears to run directly from Borehole C1 to the stone walls on Lot 15. Huntley, who has been to the bottom of C1 several times in the past, lowers an HD multi-C cam to the bottom of the shaft. During this process, the camera alights upon a yellow-colored triangular anomaly in the anhydrite. One foot below the triangular object, the camera picks up another yellow anomaly in the cavern wall, this one circular and much smaller than the first. Then, on the wall of the cavity opposite these anomalies, the treasure hunters locate a third golden speck. 
the treasure hunters deem these three mysterious yellow spots worth investigating manually. Terry Matheson later remarks that there are, quote, no known natural emplacement of minerals that look like gold in anhydrite. Later in the episode, Charles Barkhouse, Doug Crowell, and Scott Barlow welcome professional divers Bob Ritzy and Tyler Newton to Oak Island, Mike Huntley being unavailable. Newton, we learn, has been tasked with searching for the three gold-colored anomalies picked up by the underwater camera. As the members of the dive team make their preparations, the Canadian treasure hunters Skype with the Lagina brothers, Craig Tester, Jack Begley, and Gary Drayton, so that they can observe the operation remotely. Once the preparations are complete, Newton, assisted by dive master Brad Conrad, who instructs him from a control room on the surface, slowly descends into C1 in a cylindrical cage. If this gives you a sense of deja vu, there's a good reason for it. As mentioned, Tyler Newton is not the first diver to explore the cavity at the bottom of borehole C1 in search of a shiny, gold-colored object indicated by an underwater camera operation. Back in Season 4, Episode 9, professional wreck diver John Chatterton made a preliminary dive to the C1 cavern, in which he located what he thought might be the entrance of a tunnel. At the end of that same episode, Mike Huntley dove to the bottom of C1 and, using a handheld metal detector, discovered what appeared to be three metal objects embedded in the anhydrite wall, which the three yellow spots discovered in this episode very much evoke. His vision impaired by floating silt, Huntley was unable to visually locate the metal objects and returned to the surface. Immediately upon Huntley's ascension, John Chatterton dove down C1 with a handheld metal detector but was unable to find any trace of metal in the cavern wall. The diver also determined that the potential tunnel he had discovered during his earlier dive was probably a natural fissure. Huntley dove on C1 a second time in the Season 5 premiere of The Curse of Oak Island. While exploring the C1 cavern, his metal detector once again got several hits, indicating the presence of some metallic object embedded in the anhydrite wall. After vainly struggling to chisel one of these objects loose, Huntley, at personal risk, exceeded his allotted dive time in order to stuff a bag full of sediment from the cavern floor. When he returned to the surface, the sediment he collected contained no trace of the mysterious shiny objects indicated by the visual probe from Season 3. In this episode, diver Tyler Newton descends in a cage to a depth of 40 feet without incident. A trap door on the cage's bottom then opens, allowing Newton to slip out and continue the dive manually. The diver sinks deeper into the murky water, a video camera on his helmet allowing the treasure hunters on the surface to see from his point of view in real time. Newton reaches the bottom of the caisson and swims into the cavity below, where he begins to examine the cavern wall. After remarking that the anhydrite has, quote, lots of areas that reflect light, unquote, Newton comes across a particularly shiny object embedded in the rock. He attempts to pry the object loose with a knife, but only succeeds in scraping flakes of some bright white substance from it, which crumble into powder in his hand. Newton continues to chip away at several pieces of shiny material adhered to the cavern wall. One of these pieces, which resembles an old coin, eludes the diver's grasp and sinks to the bottom of the cavity, where Newton is unable to retrieve it. Upon the diver's return to the surface, we learn that the samples he extracted are nothing more than flakes of anhydrite some of which bear reflective crystallization. In a later interview, Rick Lagina expresses interest in the coin-like object which fell to the cavern bottom, which Tyler Newton was unable to retrieve. He suggests that the team might be able to bring the object to the surface through the use of an airlift, which Oak Island Tours Inc. has successfully used in other shafts in the past. Earlier in the episode, back in Traverse City, Rick Lagina, Marty Lagina, and Craig Tester have a Skype meeting with David Irving, Matt Kingston, and other representatives of Irving Equipment Limited. Using augmented reality technology, the Irving executives show the treasure hunters an animation of the Money Pit area, in which caissons are sunk in a honeycomb pattern, an arrangement which would allow for the sinking of more caissons per area than the square grid pattern in which drill holes have been sunk in previous years. David Irving informs the treasure hunters that shafts sunk in this manner could be reinforced with temporary casings, which would allow for future reinvestigations. Marty Lagina agrees to consider Irving's honeycomb grid proposal. Five days later, regulations regarding Canada-USA travel are loosened, allowing certain specially approved Americans to visit Canada provided they self-isolate for two weeks upon their arrival in the Great White North. In light of this new development, Rick and Marty Lagina, Alex Lagina, and Peter Fornetti apply for and receive permission to travel to Canada. 
the treasure hunters fly to Halifax and drive to a house somewhere in Nova Scotia, where they prepare to wait out their 14-day quarantine. Shortly after the Lagina's arrival in Canada, the Oak Island crew has a meeting in the War Room, the quarantine Americans in attendance via video conference. Laird Niven informs the team that, quote, a very experienced archaeologist named David McGuinness, who happens to be a direct descendant of Money Pit co-discoverer Daniel McGuinness, will lead the upcoming search for the potential tunnel on Oak Island's Lot 15. McGuinness will be assisted by Aaron Taylor, an archaeologist who appeared on the show back in Season 7, Episode 18. Later that day, Laird meets with Aaron Taylor and David McGuinness on Lot 15, at the site of the aforementioned stone walls indicated as a potential tunnel entrance on the Fred Nolan survey map which Doug Kroll discovered. Taylor and McGuinness have already dug a very shallow preliminary trench in the area. McGuinness remarks that the soil appears to have been previously disturbed, and discloses that he and Taylor found some machine-made nails and charcoal a short distance below the surface while digging their trench. Niven proceeds to excavate the trench with a trowel, and discovers a piece of slag, a byproduct of the smelting of iron ore. This is the second piece of slag to be discovered on Oak Island, the first having been found in Borehole H8 in Season 6, Episode 13. In light of this find, David McGuinness suggests that the nearby stone walls are not the ruins of a house or barn, but rather constitute the remains of a forge or iron foundry. The question, in my mind, he says, is why would there be a blacksmith shop here? Later in the episode, we learn that blacksmithing expert Carmen Legg, upon examining Lot 15's stone walls off-camera, identified the structure as an English tar kiln, dating from 1550 to 1620, in which wood was converted into tar. This diagnosis evokes a theory laid out by Canadian author Joy A. Steele in her and co-author Gordon Fader's 2019 book, Oak Island Mystery Solved, The Final Chapter. In her book, Steele argues that Oak Island served as a secret manufacturing center for naval stores, or ship-related materials, specifically pine tar, intended for use as ship caulking from 1720 to 1722. Steele contends that this clandestine operation was conducted by members of the South Sea Company, a British joint stock company which enjoyed a monopoly of the transatlantic slave trade in the early 1700s. Steele argues that there was never any treasure buried on Oak Island, and that the money pit was a natural sinkhole, which the company men converted into a tar-producing ground kiln. She attributes the mysterious nocturnal lights, which 18th century Mahone Bay settlers are said to have seen flickering on the island, to fires which burned in Oak Island's ground kilns, and hints that the two fishermen whom legend says rode out to the island to investigate these lights in 1720 may have been killed by company men who hoped to keep their enterprise secret. Later in the episode, Jack Begley and Gary Drayton, who have just completed their own 14-day quarantines, drive to Oak Island and head straight to Lot 15, carrying Gary's new OKM EXP 6000 metal detector with them. After meeting Laird Niven, the treasure hunters unpack Gary's new device and begin scanning in the vicinity of the stone walls. At a place in the woods about 100 feet west of the walls, Gary Drayton stumbles upon a ring of cracked stones, which he suspects is unnatural. He and Jack decide to leave the stone formation as it is, until Laird Niven and the other archaeologists have a chance to examine it. Drayton and Begley wrap up their scanning operation, and begin looking through the data they collected. There's a hell of a lot of material in this area, says Drayton of the data in a later interview. Quote, a lot of iron, but even more important, there's some non-ferrous targets. Well, I'm a treasure hunter, that's probably gold and silver coins. Having located several potential areas of interest, Drayton and Begley return to Lot 15, the former equipped with his regular CTX-3030 metal detector, and begin to scan for metal targets. The pair quickly unearths an old broken axe head. Just the weight of it tells me this is really old, Drayton says as he hefts the artifact, before identifying it as a ship's rigging axe. Shortly thereafter, the treasure hunters discover a very old coin with a square hole through its middle which an enthusiastic Drayton declares to be a top-pocket find. In a later interview, Drayton expresses his belief that the coin is not European, but rather a product of somewhere, quote, much more exotic, and tentatively dates it to the 17th or 18th century. Although Drayton later informs his fellow treasure hunters that he and Jack made an interesting find on Lot 15, he refuses to disclose any hints regarding its nature until the entire fellowship is assembled in person on the island, declaring that the discovery is, quote, worth waiting for. 
This artifact, which Drayden and Begley unearthed on Lot 15, vaguely resembles an old token, discovered in muck withdrawn from the swamp during a draining operation conducted in Season 6, Episode 21. Drayton tentatively identified that artifact as a 17th or 18th century coin through which some disgruntled North American colonist punched a hole in protest of the reigning monarch. Drayton's cryptic suggestion that the perforated coin discovered on Lot 15 constitutes a piece of currency minted in some exotic country, coupled with the coin's strange appearance, strongly hints at some sort of Chinese connection with the Oak Island mystery. Throughout China's long and turbulent history, from the ancient Warring States period which preceded the formation of China's first empire, until the early years of the Republic of China in the 1910s, most Chinese coins were round coins with square holes through their middles. The holes allowed the coins to be threaded onto rods for easy counting and storage, and onto strings for easy handling. If the coin from Lot 15 indeed proves to be Chinese, it would bolster the Spanish theory since members of the 17th and 18th century Spanish Empire traded extensively with Ming and Qing China via the Philippines, which in those days was a colony of Spain. The coin's possible Chinese origin also evokes a more exotic, if less likely, Oak Island theory, which this author has personally considered, for which, incredibly, there are several tantalizing pieces of evidence. In the early 1400s, during the reign of the Ming Dynasty, China's so-called Yongle Emperor or the Emperor of Perpetual Happiness, launched seven spectacular expeditions, called Treasure Voyages, to various maritime kingdoms west of China, from the Khmer Empire of present-day Cambodia to the Malindi Kingdom of present-day Kenya. Although Chinese envoys and merchants had regularly sailed to northeastern Africa and Arabia by way of the Indian Ocean since at least the reign of the Tang Dynasty, which ruled China in the midst of Europe's Dark Ages, the Ming treasure voyages of the early 1400s constituted the largest and most impressive Chinese ambassadorial expeditions to the so-called Western Sea at that time. The purpose of the Ming treasure voyages was to secure tribute from the various kingdoms that bordered the Indian Ocean and solidify China's self-styled status as the Zhongguo, or Middle Kingdom, around which the world revolved. In order to effect this end, the treasure fleet would carry extravagant imperial gifts to the kingdoms in question, the magnitude of its ships and the quantity of its sailors tacitly demonstrating China's superiority to the inhabitants of these foreign lands. In preparation for this ambassadorial enterprise, the Chinese emperor commissioned the construction of around 60 colossal treasure junks, said to measure 138 meters in length and 56 meters in width, each of them crewed by several hundred to a thousand sailors. Legend has it that half the trees in southern China were felled to supply the wood for the emperor's armada. The Yongle emperor appointed his favorite courtier, Zhonghe, a Muslim eunuch from the Mongol-turned-Chinese province of Yunnan, the admiral of his treasure fleet. And in 1405, Zhenghe led this so-called floating city, along with about 250 supplemental warships, on its first treasure voyage to the Indian kingdom of Calicut. Zhenghe's treasure voyages successfully inched further west, and by his seventh and final voyage, which lasted from 1431 to 1433, the Chinese courtier sailed as far west as Kenya, where he received tributes of gold, giraffes, and African lions from the local Malindi king. When Zhenghe returned to China after his seventh treasure voyage, he learned that his benefactor, the Yongle Emperor, had died. Yongle's son and successor, called the Hongxi or Vastly Bright Emperor, was an isolationist who had grown resentful of his father's expensive diplomatic endeavors. On Hongxi's orders, Beijing mandarins, or imperial officials, destroyed all of Zhenghe's logs and records and burned the enormous Chinese treasure fleet. Although most mainstream historians contend that no members of Zhenghe's treasure fleet sailed further west than Kenya, a tantalizing illustration and accompanying description, drawn in the margins of a 1450 map of the world produced by a Venetian cartographer called Fra Mauro, hint at some sort of nautical Chinese presence in the Atlantic Ocean. The image in question is a ship bearing great resemblance to a Chinese junk, sailing west from the Cape of Good Hope. An accompanying description, written in Italian, tells of a ship from the Orient, which was swept into the Sea of Darkness, or the Atlantic Ocean, by a storm in about 1420. Nothing but air and water was seen for 40 days, the description goes, and by their reckoning they ran 2,000 miles and fortune deserted them. When the storm abated, the sailors of this unfortunate vessel managed to make their way back to the Cape of Good Hope, completing the return journey in 70 days. 
If a medieval Chinese junk was indeed swept into the Atlantic Ocean by a freak storm and carried into the Gulf Stream, it is conceivable that the occupants of such a craft may have found their way to the eastern shores of North America and up the Atlantic coast to Oak Island. If this hypothetical junk had been carrying imperial gifts in its hold, it is also conceivable that its sailors may have buried these treasures on Oak Island for safekeeping, before risking a return journey to China. Unlikely though this theory may be, it would neatly explain one of the most baffling discoveries ever made on Oak Island, namely the coconut fiber which once comprised a layer of the Smith's Cove beach filter, which has repeatedly been carbon dated to around the 13th or 14th centuries AD. Recall that coconuts are not endemic to the New World, but rather to Southeast Asia and the coastal regions of the Indian Ocean, and are believed to have first been introduced to the Caribbean by Portuguese explorers in the late 1400s. If 700-year-old coconut fiber was indeed deposited on Oak Island shortly after its harvesting, it almost certainly came from these regions, in which Zhong He's treasure fleet had a strong presence. This exotic notion that the medieval Chinese might be behind the Oak Island mystery could also account for the large quantities of broken pottery found on Oak Island over the years, precious Chinese porcelain being among the chief commodities which Zhong He bestowed upon the monarchs with whom he treated during his voyages. Just prior to Gary Drayton and Jack Begley's discovery of the strange coin on Lot 15, Dr. Ian Spooner meets with diver Tony Sampson at the Oak Island Swamp, determined to conduct a sonar scan of the aforementioned anomaly in the swamp's southeastern corner, which he identified when comparing an old photograph of the marsh with seismic survey data collected in Season 7. Spooner, equipped with a PsyQuest Hydrobox Echo Sounder sonar device, proceeds to row into the swamp in a dinghy, while Sampson dons his wetsuit and wades into the wetland. Sampson guides Spooner's dinghy over top of the anomaly, which the sonar device indicates is some sort of one to two meter tall wall, buried beneath two meters of mud. Dr. Spooner is not the first treasure hunter to identify an area of interest in the southeastern corner of the swamp. During a War Room meeting in Season 1, Episode 3, Rick Lagina and Dave Blankenship described how, during a previous investigation, a smooth three-foot by eight-foot rock and a tunnel connecting the swamp to the ocean were discovered in the swamp's southeastern corner. In the middle of this episode, Doug Crowell explains that Fred Nolan, years ago, discovered what he believed to be a wood-cribbed shaft in the same area. In Season 2, Episode 8, GPR experts Pat Campbell and Matt Savell conducted a ground-penetrating radar scan of the southeastern corner of the swamp, and picked up indications of a flat surface at the swamp's bottom. And in Season 6, Episode 21, theorist Chris Dona presented his hypothesis involving a Freemasonic star map, which he believed indicated areas of interest on Oak Island. On Dona's map, the star Spica lies over top of the swamp's southeastern corner. Dona expressed his belief that the treasure hunters will find a, quote, back door to the money pit, unquote, at this location. The episode ends with a short memorial to Kevin Burns, the producer of The Curse of Oak Island and the popular History Channel TV series Ancient Aliens, who died of cardiac arrest on September 27, 2020. Surrounding a portrait of Burns are the words, In Memoriam, Kevin Burns, 1955-2020. You showed us the world and beyond. Rest in peace. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to help support this channel, please check out my book, The Oak Island Encyclopedia, Volume 2, which you can find by clicking the link in the description. The Yongle Emperor appointed his favorite courtier, Zheng He, a Muslim... <laughs> the Yongle Emperor... <clears throat> the Yongle Emperor appointed his favorite courtier, Zheng He, a Muslim eunuch from the... Mo <laughs> A Muslim eunuch from the Mongol turned Chinese. Pro